All right, who's ready to continue our series stronger? All right, now I'm going hear you. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, I'm getting buffed today. We're getting stronger. This series should be making you stronger. I, I expect you to get stronger in your spiritual walk with the Lord. It is teaching us how to put on every piece of the armor of God. And the Bible says we become strong and we can stand firm when we have on the whole armor of God. And we have too many people getting blown around that they are falling down every time frustration comes, every time something happens that they're not planning, they, they find themselves falling away, detaching themselves from God, the church, isolation, things happening because things aren't going the way they thought they should. But the Bible says just the opposite, that we are to respond. It says we are to stand firm. He says, I want you to learn how to stand firm through every trial, through every tribulation, through every frustration. I want you to learn how to stand firm. And he goes, you can do that when you put on every piece of the armor. Have you ever felt like the sun is coming out on a rainy day and you see the one, one little beam coming out of the clouds and you're like, yes, the sun's going to come out. You know, I remember when I was a kid, we were wanting to go swimming, you know, with a pool open back up, the public pool open back up, and it's raining, they got to shut down, but we, we see one, one bean coming out, we're like, just maybe, just maybe we're going swimming today, only to have the clouds roll back in, you're like, oh, it's so frustrating. I, I remember uh, a few weeks ago when they opened up the restaurants where we could go back in and, and have limited seating, but at least go back in and sit down and enjoy some of our favorite spots. And my wife and I went to one of our favorite eating spots and we sit down in one of the booths there. And every other booth had a big yellow caution tape X on it, blocking it off. And we we're sitting down and I told my wife, I said, I feel like I'm eating at a crime scene. You know, <laughs> this is like, Everything was marked off around us. But I didn't care because I was so frustrated. I was glad just to have that little bit of hope again of eating inside of a restaurant, even if I had caution tape down. You know, it can be frustrating. It can be frustrating when we decided to open back up churches and we had people attacking the church. I had people sending me private messages. I had people attacking our church and other churches across the U.S., saying, you know, pastors, why are you opening back up? You know, and, and, but yet it's frustrating when we can not complain about the casinos being open and not about the bars being open, about Walmart and Home Depot being open, but somebody wants to complain about the church being open. It's frustrating, isn't it? Yeah, it gets really, really frustrating. We have to learn to, learn to work through those frustrations. It's frustrating when we, we see videos and, and we see all the racial injustice going on and we see racial discrimination going on. And it's frustrating to see people who will still be in denial and say we don't have a problem when obviously we still have a problem with it. It's, it can be frustrating. So, so how do we move? How do we respond when we're frustrated? How do we respond as Christians? What is the Bible expecting from us when we go through this time of frustration? The best way to deal with this is what we're going to talk about today is keep doing good. Keep doing good. The Bible is very clear about how we are to respond when we're frustrated, when we're facing evil things, when we're facing opposition the Bible is very clear that he wants us to keep doing good. So today we're going to talk about that. We've been in training. We've been talking about the last couple of weeks. Look at this image here. We've been talking about the belt of truth. In the first week we gave you an introduction. We talked about put on the belt of truth. Paul said, I want you to put on the whole armor of God. And he named the belt of truth. This brings, a, brings a support to our core. We got to know at our core, we got to know who we are in God, the truth of God's word, what he says about me, that I am a child of the king. Last week, we talked about putting on the shoes, the, the shoes of peace. It's all about the shoes, right? It really connected with many people. I had a lot of messages. It really stirred up something in some people's heart. If you missed last week's sermon, I highly recommend you go online and catch up with that sermon. A lot of people said, man, that really was for me. That really spoke to me. We got to put on the shoes of peace every day and lift up the shield of faith. Let's go to our text today, Ephesians 6, 17. And now it's our next piece of the armor. The Bible tells us is that we put on the salvation as your helmet, 
okay? We're called to put salvation on as a helmet and then take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, next week, we're going to be talking about the sword of the Spirit. Next week's going to be a lot of fun because next week, I'm going to teach you how to fight, okay? These, these three first three weeks, it's about, you know, how to wear your armor, how to prevent, how to stand. But next week, I'm going to teach you how to be spiritually aggressive. Let me put it another way. I ain't raised a bunch of spiritual whims, so I'm going to teach you how to fight for yourself and how to stand up. That's what I want to tell you today. Okay, there you go. Well, I don't believe in violence. Well, let me tell you, there's a, there's a war going on, and you've got to learn how to stand up spiritually to that war. I'm not talking about with hands and feet. You know, I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about, but in the spirit world, we've got to learn how to stand up and use the equipment that God has given us to fight off the enemy. Today, we're talking about salvation as our helmet, okay? Why, why would we need a helmet? A helmet protects our head, right? And so what the Bible is talking about here is that we got to learn to put on our salvation to protect our mind, to protect our mind. Every day I must get up and put on and remind myself that I am to put on the helmet of salvation. It's there that I realize this thing, that this helmet of salvation reminds me of this scripture of Romans 8, 1, which says it like this. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Are you hearing that today? There is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. But we have thoughts all the time that are trying to come into our head, thoughts of condemning thoughts that either we give ourselves, or the enemy is trying to place there or somebody else may even say to us, Thoughts about how we've blown it in our past, how we're not good enough, that God really didn't save me, that I'm not really good enough. This person may be okay, but I can't live up to that standard. I can't live up. I've got things in my past. I have a dark past. I've made great mistakes in my past. I've made many mistakes in my past. And the Bible makes it very clear there is no condemnation. That is what our salvation reminds me. My salvation reminds me. Look at this graph here. That we got to realize that when Jesus died on the cross for our sins, he paid the penalty for all of our sins in our past. How many are thankful for the grace of God that he paid the price of our sins? The Bible says that when Jesus died on the cross, that he took the weight of the sin upon the cross. So when God the Father looks at Jesus and he looks at us, he looks at us and says, if you have even one sin, you're guilty. For all have fallen short of the glory of God. Me, you, we're all guilty. And he took our guilt and said, all right, Jesus, you must take the punishment of this guilt. He pronounced us guilty. He gave the punishment to his son. And now his son died on the cross for our sins. And all who believe in the power of what Jesus did on the cross and the fact that he was resurrected on the third day, now we are treated like the son. And when the father looks at us, he doesn't look at us as guilty. He looks at us as forgiven, redeemed, justified. The price of sin has been paid. Now we are in right standing with the father. It's an amazing thing we have. So he died for our sins. So no longer did my past has power over me. You got to realize. So I, I remind myself every day, my past does not have power over me. I get on and put my helmet of salvation, protect my mind, that I'm protected from that. And then I'm also protected by the power of sin presently. And that works twofold. I have been given forgiveness of my sins that I am currently commit now. Now, let me tell you this. But I've also been given power over those sins as well. I don't have to continue to live in sin. I need to be growing stronger. I shouldn't be committing as many sins as I did last year. I need to grow. I need to get stronger. I need to get more mature. I need to be walking toward the Father more and more and more. And so, why? Because I've been given freedom by the power of the cross. Sin does not have power in my life. I may still make a mistake. And when I do, the Bible says that is forgiven. What do you mean, Pastor Gene? Let me ask you a question. If I commit a sin tomorrow, does Jesus have to come back down to he from heaven and get back on the cross and die for me again? No. Why? 
Because when he hung at the cross, Jesus, one of the last words he said was what? Father, it is finished. The price of sin was finished. The hold of sin is finished. And so my sins have been forgiven in my past. And as a Christian, when I commit a sin now, I have grieved the heart of the Father, but my sin has been forgiven. And the great news is this, is that my sins in the future, they're not forgiven because he's preparing a place. He's preparing a place where sin will no longer be there. And so my sins of the past are dealt with. I've been given power to overcome sin presently. And I've also, he's preparing a place where sin will never be there. It's a place where the presence of the Lord will reign, will, will reign and there will be no presence of sin in that place. It's called heaven. We're going to spend eternity with them in a place with the absence of sin, the absence of racism, the absence of injustice, the absence of lies and, and guilt and hurt and betrayal. We're going to be in a place where God is glorified and brothers and sisters are going to love each other. We're going to worship our Father together. He, he's broken that. It's the power of sin has been broken in the world. What's my job? My job is simply to believe. I believe he was the Messiah. I believe he died on the cross for my sins and the sins of the world. I believe he was resurrected on the third day. I, he said, you do that, you surrender your life to Jesus, you can operate in the freedom of our sin. So this is what we have. But the problem is simply this, is that we carry around way too much baggage in our life. We're walking around carrying this, this baggage from our past. Man, I, I, I blew it. I blew it here with my family. I, I blew it here in my past. I, I've hurt people. I've made great mistakes. And we're walking around like this all the time. We're walking around wondering why we're not getting anywhere. Wondering why we're not making any, any grounds. Look, look what it says in Isaiah 43, 18. He says, forget the former things and don't dwell on the past. So you can see I'm doing a new thing. I wish God would do a new thing in me. Well, it could be if you would just lay down your past. See, some of us are showing up at church every week like this. God, I wish you'd do a new thing in me. God, I don't know why. I'm so tired. I can't run this race any longer. I'm always so spiritually fatigued. I don't have any, I want something new to happen. And I don't know why. Well, we're walking around carrying our past with us. We're walking around carrying the very thing that Jesus delivered us from. He delivered this hold of sin in my life. He delivered this to me from that. And so I can lay that down and walk and say, all right, God, I'm ready for something new now. I can, my future is bright now. I can look and see, God, you're wanting to create a new family. God, you're wanting to start something new. Generational curses have been broken off of my life. And as for me and my house, we're going to experience something new in God. It's a new freedom. How can you just lay your past down? Because Jesus took care of it. You see, have you ever heard of the term double jeopardy? It's a legal term that a person cannot be tried twice for the same crime. So if a person went through and was uh, found guilty or innocent either way and received a punishment that they can't come back 10 years later for the same crime, they can't do it. They've already been tried and found guilty or innocent. You see, we stood trial before the father and he looked at us and said, guilty, son, take their punishment. And guilt was given, punishment was dealt with Jesus took that punishment upon the cross. And now we can walk redeemed of the Lord. So the, we can't come back and be like, all right, you know, remember that sin in the past. No, no, no. You know what? Jesus already took this. And now the Father looks at me and says, forgiven. 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 Why am I, if I'm forgiven, why am I still carrying this past with me? Why? Look at this statement. I want you to see it here. When I carry my past, I can't carry my armor. When I carry my past, I can't carry my armor with me. See, some of us wonder why we're not walking around 
with the whole armor of God. Could it be our hands are just full of things in our past? This time we lay it down. Say, Father, I'm not going to bring that back up. You've already dealt with it. You've broken the curse of sin in my life. I'm going to walk in that new power. I'm going to learn what it means to overcome sin. Instead of being dominated by sin now, I'm going to learn that I have the power to overcome sin. But if I don't, you still got the power to forgive that sin. You've already taken care of it. I don't have to live in that condemnation. So I put on my helmet of salvation. It protects me. Look what Galatians 6, 9 says. So what do we do? We put on our helmet of salvation, then we got to learn to do what's good. So let us not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap the harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Listen, don't stop doing good when you're frustrated. Don't stop doing good when you're aggravated. Don't stop doing good when things happen. Listen, you're not going to change the world. You're not going to change the world through a social media post. You're not going to change the world by arguing with somebody on Facebook about something. It's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen. But how can I change the world if I go out and I just do something good? And I do the good thing before me today. And you do the good thing. And I teach my children to do the good thing. We're going to make an impact of good. And we're going to show God's goodness to a community. And hopefully it spreads. That's how I make a difference. He says, don't get tired of doing good. See, we can get really tired of doing the right thing. Sometimes it feels like I'm the only one doing the right thing. You ever felt that way? It seems that way sometimes, doesn't it? He goes, but you will reap a harvest of blessing. Don't give up. Keep doing the good thing today. And somebody needs to hear that word today. Don't give up. Keep doing good. Your blessing is closer than you think. The answer is closer than you think. Keep doing the right thing. Keep doing the good thing. Keep doing what God has called us to do. Don't give up. That's what God's called us to do. Don't give up. Do the next good thing. Write that down. So what's the answer? How do I do the good thing? Do the next good thing. I know this is really deep, right? Do the next good thing. What do you mean, pastor? Whatever you see today that needs to be done, do it. Whatever you see tomorrow that needs to be done, do it. Look for opportunities that are presenting themselves. Who's the next person I can encourage? Who's the next person you can bless? Who's the next person you can help? Who's the next person you can forgive? Who's the next person you can serve? Who's the next person? Look for somebody to do good. Look for a way to do good. The other day, I was, my wife and I were driving by uh, these, these roll of stores, and I heard some music come in. So I rolled down the window, and I was recording it because I, I really liked the music. It was a different music, and I was listening to it and put a smile on my face. And when we passed by, I saw a sign that was asking for donations, and they were telling the reason why they needed the money. And I've always have a rule that I don't usually help people sitting on the corner with a sign because as they teach us around in this area, they, they ask us don't actually to give the people holding those signs because 99.9% .9 of them are, are scam artists. And we're not, there's plenty of places in town where people can get help. There's a lot of places in town. We, we're funding those places. We support those places where people can actually get help to overcome that lifestyle and to get out of the mess they're in. And so they, they teach us not to do that. So I'm automatically, I'm thinking I'm not going to do it. But as I passed by, I saw this sign and I thought, you know what? They're out there playing music to earn money. I, I, I can respect that. And so I told my wife, we're back around there. And I reached into my pocket and I was going to put some money in. And usually, you know, if somebody's playing music, you would give just a, you know, maybe a dollar or two or something. And I, I just thought, you know what? I saw this big bill in my, my pocket and the Lord said, give them the big bill. I said, all right, God. And, and I did that and put a big smile on their face, you know, and I drove away. And I thought, you know, just, just an opportunity when you hear the Lord. Who knows when you just see something where you can bless somebody. I had a chance to do good for somebody that day. Who how many opportunities we pass by that, that God's wanting us to do something good for somebody? Maybe it's stopping and praying for somebody. Maybe it's a word of encouragement. Maybe it's helping somebody who, who has a flat tire on the side of the road. Somebody who's needing to jump in the parking lot of the store. Somebody who who's, looks like they need some help and just, are you okay? Can I do anything to help you? Just looking for opportunities to do the right thing, the good thing. How do I keep standing firm? I keep doing the good thing. 
See, when I, when I keep my eyes on doing the next good thing, my eyes are off of all the chaos. How do I make my spirit feel better? You ever notice that when you do good for others, it, you, you feel good? Not only are you blessing other people, but it's like it comes right back to you. It encourages you as well. I read this story the other day, and I thought it was an awesome story of a young man. He was a senior in high school, and his name was Antonio Gwynn Jr. out of Buffalo, New York. And a couple weeks ago, after the riots had broken out in his town, they had shattered glass and looted stores. And this young man was seen on, on, on the news. And so when things began to quiet down, at 2 o'clock in the morning, this young man grabbed a broom and some garbage bags and dustpan, and he went out. He started sweeping up glass off the street and the sidewalks at 2 o'clock in the morning by himself. And they asked him, said, what, what, are you, what are you doing this for? He goes, well, there's people who got to get up and walk on this tomorrow morning to go to work, and this is unsafe. I just feel like someone needs to come out and clean it up. And he worked, and he worked out there all night, and the next morning there had been a group of neighborhood people who had gotten together and decided they were going to come together, and they were going to go out there and clean up all that mess. And when they got out there to clean up all that mess, they saw this young man had already done the majority of it by himself. He'd been out there for eight hours by himself, cleaning up all this mess. And someone took a picture and put it on Facebook, bragging on this young man. And then other people started liking the post, and then somebody saw the post and started reading, following the young man, and saw where he was asking questions about a car and realized he didn't have a car. And so another young man who was 28 years old had a Mustang that he'd convertible that he'd always wanted, and he'd babied this thing and fixed it up really nice. It was paid for, and he decided he was going to give this, this older Mustang that was taken care of, give it away to this young man. So he went and found a young man, gave him the keys and the title, and said, man, I just want to give you a car. I know you didn't have a car, and I want to give you a car and bless you. And they said the young man was just so taken off by it, number one, because he wouldn't expect a car. Number two, he teared up really bad. They said, what, what's wrong? And he goes, well, sir, what you don't realize is this. He goes, uh, my mom died two years ago. And she had a red Mustang. So this really means a lot to me. The story got out and one of the local auto dealers said, I'm going to pay that young man's insurance, son. And said, for the next couple of years, I've got your auto insurance covered. And they were talking to him and then they interviewed him. What, what's your plans after high school? Well, I'm going to try to go to community college or maybe a trade school and then earn enough money I can go to college later on. And then Buffalo University steps up, no, no, sir, you're going to come to our college. You're going to go scot-free because we're paying you all your way through tuition through school. I'm telling you, when you step out to do the right thing and the good thing, even when nobody else sees you, even when it seems like nobody else is paying attention to what you're doing, when you do the right thing and the good thing, God always takes care of you. See, we're all about doing the good thing as long as we get... We can post it on Facebook, right? Come on now, you know what I'm talking about. We're, we're all good about, there's nothing wrong with promoting because that helps promote other people to do good things as well. I'm not against that. But what I'm saying is, do, will you do the right thing and good thing even if nobody's there taking a picture? Will you do the good thing even when nobody else notices? Will you do the good thing even when it doesn't benefit anybody else? And you get zero return for doing it other than you're just doing what you know is the next good thing. That's where God wants us to be. That's where God's asking us to be. So I protect my head with the helmet of salvation. Every day I get up, I remind myself of my salvation. Thank you, there is no condemnation of those who belong to Christ Jesus. Thank you, Father, you've taken care of the sins of my past. I don't have to carry this baggage around with me. I can lay it at the feet of Jesus and I can walk free. And then it says, as we close today, I want to give you this last piece. It says we need to put on the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate protects our heart. Now, the reason why you would wear protecting your heart is because that's where the enemy's shooting for. He says the enemy is shooting those fiery arrows at you. They're not aiming for your foot. They're aiming for your heart. They're aiming for your heart. Why? Because if I can hit your heart, you're dead, right? You got to realize the enemy is after our heart. If he can get you mad, if he can get you upset, if he can get you bitter, if he can get you uh, angry, if he can get you upset at people, hurt in your heart and you're carrying it in your heart, he's destroying your life. No, you got to get up and protect your heart. 
No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the right thing. Why? It's the breastplate of righteousness. What does righteousness mean? It simply means this, to stand in right standing with God. That I have been put in right standing because of what Jesus did on the cross. He took my sins upon the cross. And now all who believe in Jesus can now be put in right standing with the Father. So when the Father looks at me, he looks at me the way he looks at his son Jesus. He says, you've been, you've been taken care of. You're in right standing with me. Son, daughter, you're now righteous. See, now we got to realize that I've been put into that righteousness and i got to use that to protect my heart. It doesn't make a difference what somebody else thinks of me. God's already looked at me and says, righteous. It doesn't make a difference what somebody else does to me. God looks at me and says, righteous. It frees me up. It frees me up. It protects my heart. So my job is not only to be in right standing with God, which I've been made through the Son. And now my job is also to give it away. To give it away. To do right to others, even when they don't deserve it. Do the right thing for people who don't even ask for it. Let me leave you with a couple of verses just to really challenge you to go deeper today to a different level. This is going to really stretch you. Are you ready? Okay. Romans 12, 14, and 15. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. It says we're to weep with those who weep. Not say, oh, dry up those tears. I don't agree with you. No. He says if someone's hurting, we should weep with them. If somebody's happy, let's celebrate with them. And he goes, if somebody persecutes you, learn to pray for them and bless them. Wow. Now that really is doing a good thing, right? But that's what Jesus, listen, that's what Jesus did for us. And he's calling us to a higher level. He's giving you a higher standard. He's pushing you. Come on, don't stay there in the valley of frustration and immaturity all your life. Let the whole armor of God elevate you to a place where you can learn to operate. Let's try this one. How about verses 17 and 18? He goes, never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Boy, that's tough, isn't it? Because we want to pay an eye for an eye. You hurt me, I hurt you back. That's our natural instinct. And Jesus said, no, no, no. Because I want you to to think higher than that. I want you to go higher than that. Don't pay back evil with more evil. That's not the answer. He goes, walk honorable. Walk with honor. Why? Why? Because I've been made righteous. I've been made righteous. I can walk with honor. Live your life in a way that honors the Father. How can I show goodness? Because the Father showed goodness to me. One more here, and we're going to close. 20, 21. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, I want you to feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will... Keep burning coals of shame on their head. Don't let evil conquer you. Listen, don't let it conquer you. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Keep doing the good thing. Musician Daryl Davis wrote a book, How Can You Hate Me If You Don't Even Know Me? I've never read the book, but I have seen several interviews of him about the book and listened to podcasts, him talking about some of the stories in the book. And Daryl Davis is a famous uh, African-American musician, very good at the piano. And when his band would tour and play certain places, that people would just crowd to hear him play the piano because he was so good. He would, and he would tear that piano up. It was really, really amazing. And one night he was playing at a particular place and people they were there watching him and someone said, hey, See that group of people over there watching him? He goes, they're members of the KKK. And so that kind of intrigued him. And 
he decided that after he got done playing, when they had a break, he was going to go over and talk to these guys. So he went down and introduced himself and sat down right at their table, acting like he knew nothing about them being in the KKK. He said, all of them, their eyes got this really big, like right here. Like, what is this man doing sitting at our table? He started talking to him, and then he said, hey, I, I, he was, found out that the guy he was talking to was actually one of the local, he was actually the leader of that, that state when it came to the KKK. And he was sitting down and having a meal with them, and he said, I heard you're part of the KKK. Yes, I am. And they started talking, and he listened to the guy talk about why he thought that they were superior, and then he began to talk about how he felt. He goes, is it all right if when I come back in town, I'll give you a call and you come back and we have dinner before I play again and we go out again and talk? The guy looked shocked. He was like, okay. And sure enough, the next time a few months come by and he came back to that town, he called the man up and the guy made him for dinner and he took him out to eat and ended up interviewing him. Because I like to interview him for a story I'm doing, a book I'm doing. And he took him and interviewed him and heard him his whole story. This guy began, this KK leader began to like him so much, he allowed this man to come and actually attend one of the KKK rallies for his book, for his research. Can you imagine him showing up at a KKK rally? He's there and he says he's listening to these people talk and over time they begin to all come and listen to him play and they'd eat together and he'd feed them meals and he'd, he'd pay for meals and they'd come and listen to him play. And one day the head of the KKK showed up, knocked at his door, handed him his robe and says, I'm turning my robe over to you. I'm burning my card. He goes, there's no way, there's no way. Now that I've learned to have a relationship with you, there's no way I could be a member of the KKK. He goes, and that really did something there. He goes, and over his life, he started using that same pattern and over 200 members of the KKK had turned in their robes and had burned their cards after their relationship with him just because they took time to go eat with him. See, there's something that happens when you just take an enemy and, and bless them with some food. I know it doesn't seem like a lot, a big deal, do something, look for an opportunity to do something nice to somebody who's persecuted you, who's talked bad about you. And let the goodness of God come out of you as you do the right thing. God can use it to break strongholds in other people's lives and destroy the evil that's eating at them. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. If you're here today, it all starts at the cross. It all starts at the cross. Have you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? If you haven't made that decision today, whether you're here in the auditorium or watching online, I want to extend an invitation for you to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. We won't do anything to single you out or embarrass you, but if you're ready today, say, Pastor, I'm ready to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. Can you just lift your hand where I can see it? Nobody else is looking at me. Thank you. Anybody else want to join these Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else want to join these people raising their hands today? Thank you. I see those hands, guys. Thank you. If you're online listening, raise your hand where you're at right now. Say, that's me, Pastor. I'm ready. We're going to say this prayer. If you raise your hand, I want you to say this prayer out loud with me. As Christians around you, we'll help you along as well. Say, dear Jesus, forgive me my sins. I surrender all of my life to you. I believe you are the Messiah, God's only son. And from this day forward, I will live for you. I will follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. We say welcome to the family of the Lord. Amen. That's an awesome experience.